Thank you, choir, and thank you, Foster. So when I was a little girl, back in the 1980s, uh, one of my favorite movie series was Indiana Jones. And for those of you who know that I eventually became an archaeologist, being interested in a movie about an adventurous archaeologist is probably not that surprising. Nonetheless, I wanted to share with you my favorite scenes from the beginning of the third film. For those of you who are a little fuzzy on the details, it was Harrison Ford. His father played, was played by Sean Connery. It's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And at the very beginning of the movie, we have a very young Indiana Jones. And he is exploring in a cave with the rest of his scout troop. Uh, and they find some people robbing, robbing a tomb, ro robbing an archaeological site. So he sends his friend out to get help, but the situation devolves very, very quickly, and young Indiana is forced to make a run for it himself. So he comes tearing out of this cave system in the, to the deserts of Utah, and he looks around, and the scout troop is gone. There's nobody there. You can see you know, just distance as far as you go. And he stands there, and he declares, everybody's lost but me. It's a good moment, and I think I think we've all thought it at some point in our life. But in any event, when I read the story of the prodigal son's older brother, that's the story that came to mind for me. Now, we have reached the end of our journey, traveling with Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. There's a little more road for Jesus to travel between here and the cross, but we'll rejoin him in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. These stories of being lost and found, though, are a wonderful place to pause our journey. The bit of Luke in our, that our scripture reading was drawn from today, Luke chapter 15, is composed of a whole set of parables or teaching stories that Jesus told. Thus far in his travels, Jesus' ministry has been extremely successful among the social outcasts in Judean society. Tax collectors, who were rather villainous characters, the poor, women, orphans, and other ordinary people had all really found hope and meaning and new purpose in Jesus' mission and message. But the more socially acceptable people, like the Jewish religious leaders and scholars, <clears throat> they have been part of the crowd that's been trailing after Jesus, but they're finding all of this a bit hard to take. So Jesus tells them three stories. Story number one, a shepherd who, having 99 sheep safely together in the flock, nonetheless goes out to search for that one lost sheep, rejoicing, inviting other people to rejoice with him when he finally finds her. Story number two, a woman who, having, lost, having 10 silver coins, loses just one of them and turns the house over, lighting a lamp, looking everywhere, searching high and low, until she finds it. And when she does, she throws a party. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And Jesus says to those socially acceptable folks, that's how heaven will celebrate when just one lost person repents, turns away from their old life and towards a new life in God. And then Jesus tells story number three, another very famous parable, the parable of the prodigal son. The younger son demands his share of his father's estate and then takes off, blowing it all on an extravagant and slightly immoral lifestyle. When the kid hits rock bottom, he repents of the life he has lived and how he rejected his father, he goes home. His father welcomes him with equally extravagant forgiveness and love. His son, his lost son, returned home. And there is a party to celebrate this prodigal son who was dead and is alive again, who was lost and is found. But there is a fourth story about someone else who's lost. And that's what Mary read for us this morning. And this story does not have a guaranteed happy ending. The older brother has been out working all day in the fields and arrives home in the evening only to find this huge party going on, lights and music and food and dancing. He pulls aside one of the hired help and gets told, your younger brother, your bit of a wastrel brother, he has come home and your father is so excited that he's back safe and sound that he's thrown him a big fancy party. 
The older brother is not so enthusiastic. We might call him jealous. We might call him self-righteous or resentful, and perhaps he is all of those things in this moment. But underlying this explosion of temper is a deeper hurt. The older son does not go into the house. He does not call his father father or his brother brother. It's all accusations of ungenerous parenting and this son of yours. Although he's been there all along, working hard for the family business, living in the heart of his family, he is so alienated that he can't even be happy that his brother is home. The older son, of course, is focusing on the wrong thing. The party is not the point. It's the reason for the party that matters. And so in the same way that the shepherd left the flock to go and find that one sheep, the same way that that woman left her purse on the table and looked everywhere for her tenth coin, the father comes out of the house to find his older son, and he pleads with him. But the older son says, in effect, I have been a hardworking and obedient son. I have been here, helping and working and following all your rules. I have never been lost. I am not lost now. Everybody's lost but me. I wonder if Jesus had added just one more line to this parable. How would the story have ended? Because Jesus really does stop at the most crucial moment, and there is no promise of a happy ending between the father and this son. Will the son realize that he too is lost and come with his father into the house? Or will both men eventually give up and walk away from one another, relationship broken? But the story is over. Luke chapter 16 starts, and Jesus turns to his disciples and keeps talking to them, and that's it. We will never know if this lost son ever recognized himself as lost enough to be found. It'd be very easy to dismiss the older son as being self-righteous, as being smug and arrogant, or simply a difficult person that we might not really want at our party anyway. As he stands in the yard outside a house, filled with light and music and family and food, in the dark, being told by the hired help about a family party he hasn't been invited to. Picture it in your mind. It would be so easy to label this son as the person on the outside. But remember that the story of this prodigal son, that all four of these stories about the lost are being told to a specific group of people. So let's step out of this story of lost sons and back into the conversation between Jesus and those socially acceptable people, the Pharisees and the scribes. They are the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day who have been questioning the company he keeps, but fundamentally also the message that he is preaching that demands more of them than they think they ought to give. Jesus is telling these stories not to the alienated, lost outsiders who know that they're not okay, but to the religious insiders of his day, the regular churchgoers, the know their Bible, sit on committee types, the decent, godly folks. He is speaking to those who do not believe themselves to be lost and thus have no need to repent, to reorient themselves, to turn toward God and be found. And so they, like the older son, are the most lost of all. This has become a very worrying story for us. I hope I haven't ruined your favorite parable. As individuals, it's a little easier for us to think of ourselves and to recognize and admit when we may have gone a bit astray and got lost, when we need God's love and gracious welcome, when we need that infusion of new and abundant life. And it's a little easier to cope with the idea that we might not know that we are really lost until someone, until Jesus, comes out to find us. But because Jesus is speaking to the religious insiders of his day, there is room in this story for us to be challenged to look at ourselves as a group of religious insiders, as a church. 
And it's decidedly less comfortable for us to consider the possibility that we, St. Andrews, might be a little bit lost and not even know it. We've been here all along, working hard, obediently doing what we thought best as a church and for our church, and yet, have we simply continued to turn over like a well-tuned engine, idling in the driveway with the heater and the lights and the radio on, assuming that we are not lost and never have been? That as long as we're here, that's good enough. Now you may be thinking right now that I have painted us into a corner from which there is no escape. Condemned to endlessly wonder if we're lost or found. But Jesus himself throws us a lifeline by not finishing the story. Instead, he leaves us, standing outside the house, nightfall, party sounds in the background, in that tense moment between father and son that is rife with possibility. Will we stay where we are as we are, or will we follow him? Now, back at the beginning of January, if you remember, we embarked on this sermon series of Travel Light. And we began with a question, suppose that Jesus were to take a walk with us through Sarnia today, what would he say? If you are hoping for a game-changing, revolutionary answer, here it is. Jesus would say, follow me. Leave your old notions, your old fears, your comfort zone, your fishing nets, whatever it is you're doing, wherever it is you're stuck, leave it behind and let's strike out on the road together. After six weeks or so, we now have a much clearer idea about what following Jesus will be like. And it's so much more than coming to church and reading our Bibles. That's just the beginning. Like the young theologian who thought he knew the answer and only needed to work out who his neighbor was, but wasn't asking the right question at all. Like the landowner with the bumper crop who built bigger barns and failed to invest his heart in what mattered, how we see the world and our own place in it as a church will change. If we're doing it right, following Jesus is going to be uncomfortable, not just because of the demands it places on us, but because he will also teach us to see and to feel about the world the way that he does. And what breaks Jesus' heart will break our hearts, as sharp as a jolt, like hitting a pothole at full speed. But there are also moments of profound beauty and warmth, rest stops along the way. Our connection with God and with Jesus and with one another will grow deeper and stronger through the transformative, relationship-building power of prayer and worship and serving together. And we will experience glimpses of our journey's end in the peace and wholeness of Sabbath. <clears throat> the only way to be truly lost on this journey is to assume that, assume that no journey needs to be taken, that we are not lost and never will be, never could be, because we are here, arrived, already okay, as we are. The only way to be lost and not know it is to refuse to follow Jesus any further. The end of the story is not written yet. Will we stay as we are, as we are, or will we follow Jesus? Amen. <clears throat>